Wu Zaitan, a woman who managed a feat no other woman did in the 3,000 year history of Imperial China. She ruled in her own right. It was said that Wu had the heart of a serpent and the nature like that of a wolf. Most of history has painted her as a villain. Some has painted her as a warrior. Which one is the truth? Today we're going to find out. Today we're going to talk about Wu Zaitan, not Empress, but Emperor of China. History forgot them, defamed them, destroyed them. We're putting them back in the narrative. The women lost to history will become the stories you won't forget. This is her story. Wu Zaitan began life as a minor princess, originally born Wu Mai on February 17th, 624, during the Tang Dynasty. Daughter of the governor, Duke Ding of Ying, it was thought by many that not much would come of the life of such a low-born lady. But obviously, they were wrong. Otherwise, there would be no story. When Wu was just 14 years old, she became one of the royal concubines for Emperor Tai Song. A concubine was much different than being a king's mistress. When you were a concubine, you were part of a harem of many other women, all fighting for the emperor's affection and attention. A concubine was a more formalized system, um, and in fact, there were sort of regulations to describing a kind of perfect consort system where you had a hierarchy of women in your household um, with the empress being at the top and then sort of like the next level of consorts and then yes. under that more concubines. And there were usually, I mean, there could be upwards of a hundred women who were in this kind of a harem. And for many of them, you know, this was kind of life um, as more of a kind of sexually available maid. Her main task was to change the emperor's bedding, not something the other concubines felt threatened by. But Wu was shrewd and began her manipulation for the throne very early on. Being a maid tasked with changing the emperor's bedding gave Wu access to Emperor Taizong's private chambers, and this was something she intended to take advantage of. It didn't take long for Wu to catch the eye of Emperor Taizong and move up in the concubine ranks. It is even reported that Taizong would refer to Wu publicly as the fair flatterer after a popular song at the time, and this was seen as a great compliment. Another reason it was suspected that Wu moved up in the concubine ranks so quickly is based on a rumor that has never been confirmed, and that is that Wu was willing to commit a sexual act that none of the other concubines would. Regardless of how far Wu climbed or how she did it, her glory days were cut short when Emperor Taizong died in 649. As a concubine of a dead emperor, it was custom that Wu shorn all her hair and spend the rest of her days in a nunnery. However, Wu intended to do no such thing. You see, the late Emperor Taizong's son, the new Emperor Gasong, was also fond of Wu and wanted to make her his own concubine. To have relations with a father's concubine was seen as incest and therefore forbidden. But as an emperor, rules can be bent or even broken. Song went to the nunnery where where Wu was being kept and where she had refused to cut even a single lock of her hair, and he took her back to the palace, where he soon made her his favorite concubine, and soon after that, she bore him a child. A common myth out of many that surround the history of Wu Zaitan is how she managed to make the jump from concubine to empress. Wu worked in Gasong's harem for five years, and over that course of time, she bore him four children. But the fourth of those children died. Now, some people believe the current empress Wang had killed the child, but more so believed that Wu herself had killed her own child and blamed Empress Wang. The story goes that after Wu bore her fourth child to Emperor Gasong, she was so desperate to be empress that she concocted a plan to do so. Having smothered her child in its sleep and then inviting Empress Wang and a fellow concubine down to visit the child. When Empress Wang and the fellow concubine arrived to see that the child was dead, Wu raced to Emperor Gasong and told him that Empress Wang and the concubine had killed his child. Gasong then believed Wu and abided by her wishes that Empress Wang and the fellow concubine be sent to the dungeon to undergo torture. She said after Wu had them in prison, she insisted that both their hands and feet be cut off, and then both women, somehow still alive, were drowned in a vat of wine while Wu reportedly watched and laughed and said, now these two witches can get drunk to their bones. And Emperor Gasong, being without a wife, married Wu and made her empress. There is 99% chance that none of that happened. The most likely scenario is that the child just died yeah. of an infant disease or was born weak and uh, Wu just decided to take advantage of it. So, or else, or possibly she herself did believe 
that these other women killed the child. What's what's more likely the truth is that um, I mean she was she was particularly deft at um, this kind of secret campaign of gossip and lies and and intrigue in a sense. And so what's what's likeliest is that she had the ear of the emperor Gao Zong and probably inferred or told him that these two women, the Empress and the First Consort, were conspiring against him somehow. The myth itself, though, I yeah. think really speaks to a tra tradition of demonizing women who are looking for ways to usurp power. I think, crucially, this myth was really spread after the fact and was part of the kind of salacious gossip and the really nasty stories that um, official historians were telling about Wu as well as sort of more unofficial gossipy kind of sources. Once Wu became the official empress of China, she began to stake her claim for true power. She became an integral part in the political side of things, sitting in on important meetings in the throne room, conducting her husband Emperor Gesong from behind a screen. Soon, however, Gesong suffered a series of strokes that left him unable to walk or speak and his wife Wu saw this as her opening. She began conducting political affairs for him in the meetings in the throne room alone, the screen long gone. Rumors again began to circulate around Wu that she had used witchcraft to incapacitate her husband and usurp power. But still, no one made a public display of challenging the shrewd woman's climb for power. But all that was about to change. Emperor Gesong died in 683, Wu was named Dowager Empress and expected to step down. And she did step down, but not out. Wu, just by being a woman who was ambitious and interested in having power, was already kind of disrupting this Confucian order of, of being and of power. First son she had dethroned and exiled for trying to revolt against her. Her second son was found guilty of treasonous acts and demoted to that of a commoner. Wu then let her third eldest son, Zhang Shang, ascend to the throne, thinking he'd be easier to manipulate than his two elder brothers. But when only two months into Zhang Shang's reign, he also proved immune to his mother's puppet strings, she had him exiled and replaced him with her next oldest son, Ru Song. When Ru Song also proved impossible to manipulate, she had his wife Liu accused of witchcraft, killed, and had Ru Song dethroned. After four years of trying to rule through her sons, Wu was tired of this game, so she ran her own propaganda campaign against her current ruling son, naming herself Sage Mother and Emperor of China. I mean women who effectively ruled that they had kept the title of Empress because they'd been ruling with the aid of a puppet. So what makes Wu unique is that she didn't have a puppet male sitting on the throne. But it, it, you, you see kind of, even in Western um, aristocracy and royalty circles, like you see this reference to gender quite a lot. You know, Queen Elizabeth has that famous speech about um, being a queen but having the heart and stomach of a, yes. queen, of a king. Um, it's debatable whether she actually ever said that. I mean, I think it's very debatable whether she actually <laughs> ever said that, but it's really important to understand that you know, going back to the idea that women who were taking power and authority in this way were somehow unnatural. In some cases, it worked to their benefit to say that I'm a man. You know, consider me a man. The first thing Wu did as Emperor of China was declare her own dynasty. She brought an end to the Tang dynasty and replaced it with the Zhao one. This did not bode well with many loyal Chinese men who believed for a woman to do such a thing went against Confucian law. There were many who knew to become hesitant of publicly disagreeing with their current emperor. For those who went up against Wu's rule, she had either exiled or executed. In Tang Dynasty and Zhao Dynasty China, it was not uncommon for an emperor to invite a citizen to commit suicide. If a citizen did not comply with this request, the emperor took matters into their own hands. This applied to people not just of working class, but people working in the palace alongside the emperor as well. Between the years 684 and 693, Wu herself went through 46 chief ministers of staff, many of which she had invited to commit suicide for opposing her rule. These, this was sort of really high stakes mm -hmm. um, and really high stakes court intrigue and 
people were scrambling for power in in a big way and so if you know if you if you weren't doing the job that the person in power wanted you to do then certainly they would <laughs> put pressure on you to just kill yourself and wu didn't use only this kind of bloodshed in punishing her enemies she had no hesitation in punishing those she cared for as well her first lover as emperor a leader of a buddhist cult was beaten to death on her command this large and gruesome example made it clear to the people of china not to oppose their new emperor. Whether or not these tales of Wu's bloody rule are to be believed is up for debate. See, history at the time was being written by the men, and if there was something men didn't like, it was a woman in power, and Wu held more power than any woman in history had up until that point in Imperial China. There's there's tons of evidence that male rulers did very similar things, that, that, that the pattern of behavior that she was emulating was, was in no way unique. Um, you know, she was doing what it seemed like other male rulers did. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that she was a woman made it seem unnatural. A cruelly ironic twist of fate when late Empress Taisong, Gesong, and all emperors before them kept harems of many, many women, sometimes in the thousands, a practice Wu herself was sold into as a teenager was seen as okay, when Wu herself created her own harem of young men at the age of 66, it was deemed evil, unnatural, and sinful. This public display of her female sexuality was just another brick in the wall that rebels and Tang loyalists were building slowly but surely in order to take her down. While Tang loyalists were plotting against their emperor, Wu was actually ruling China with a just and wise hand. And I think that she was very, very popular during her reign. She kept the country fairly stable. She was ruthless, but they expected rulers to be ruthless. It was an emperor ruling over a viper pit of a nation full of people with vast ideologies from Buddhism to Confucianism to Taoism, and Wu managed to take elements from each of these faiths to legitimize her claim and her power as the first female ruler of China. And it wasn't just politics over the faith of the nation's people that Wu excelled in, she was also an adept leader when it came to the military side of things as well. Wu kept their nation together against the Tartars who were trying to rip apart the northern border, and she also expanded their territory as well with little to no wars involved in such a conquest. Wu did do one very significant thing, which was that she founded the whole idea of bureaucratic examinations yeah. to join the Chinese civil service. Yeah. And that really, like, uh, that kind of defines Chinese society. It has also been suggested by author T.H. Barrett that Wu held a heavy hand in introducing printing into the modern world. If all this wasn't an impressive enough resume, Wu was also a kind ruler when it came to matters of the heart and home. It's custom in Imperial China for children to only be allowed to mourn the death of their father and not their mother, for the death of a woman was seen as insignificant. However, Wu declared that children should be allowed to mourn the losses of both their mother and father, thus making it clear that she believed in equality of the genders. But despite all these successes and tactful moves, Wu's reign was about to come to an end. After 15 years of prosperous rule, rebels and Tang loyalists finally rose up against Wu and forced her to retire. First by suggesting that she step down, which of course, Wu refused to do. Then they took to murdering two of her young lovers and leaving their bodies in her bed as a warning of why she should give up being emperor, but still Wu held firm in her position and power as emperor. Finally, the rebels broke into the palace and held a knife to Wu Zaitian's throat. And then, and only then, did the powerful and formidable Wu Zaitan step down as Emperor of China. After a year of being forced from her throne, Wu died of natural causes and was buried in the manner that was custom for late emperors in Imperial China. Late emperors were buried in sumptuous tombs marked with large memorial tablets on which were cataloged all the great triumphs and successes of that emperor's career. But Wu's memorial tablet lay blank. Rather than slander her in death, they did something much worse. They erased her completely. She had established her own dynasty. She had said she was the new emperor. So because power was going back to the previous dynasty, they had to delegitimize her. The element of historically how she was portrayed in official documents, as well as on this tablet that had nothing on it, um, it's really, really significant. I mean, whoever, you know, 
The people who get to write the story are in some ways the people who win. Her blank tablet was their way of ripping her page right out of the history books. It didn't matter that she'd done so much good for her nation. It didn't even matter that she was accused of such horrific acts. In the end, her tablet lay blank amongst the decorated ones of men. It was her female gender that was her ultimate downfall. Was Wu an evil enchantress willing to smother her own child in order to take the throne? Or was she a clever and ruthless woman living in a cruel and patriarchal time? The answer, I suspect, lies somewhere in between. The men who buried Wu worked so hard to erase her from history. But all these years later, and we remember. Many of the female you know, pe historical figures that we learn about um, have been flattened to, to a degree that we, I don't think that we would do with men. I'm Molly Lukovich. This has been her story. Thank you for watching.